Yeah, yeah. So by the time we just have the introduction, so many many more students will be going to join. So uh, today I have invited uh, two of my other colleagues. So Dr. Subrajit uh, from PLS Hospital, Calcutta. So basically, he is very much keen in research, and he has basically uh, doing all the uh, publications and research work for many of the DNB students. Uh, and also my co-colleague, Dr. Subadip. So both of them will be joining. And uh, by the time uh, we'll finish, we'll have some questions from the our students also. And then we'll wind up the discussion. So sup I suppose this will be around uh, one hour of uh, session, followed by 10, 15 minutes of discussion. So, so let me just start introdu introduction of uh, you. And uh, uh, today we have uh, with us uh, our colleague, Dr. Bharat Kumar from Chennai. And uh, we actually are lucky to have him here. He has a very keen interest in uh, this uh, research and publish publication area. And uh, he will actually promise us to take us through a series of lectures if you give him time so that our own fellows and colleagues will be benefited. But of course, this is the first uh, session of him. So I welcome Dr. Bharat. And Dr. Bharat is a consultant critical in the Department of Critical Care Medicine, Apollo Hospital, Chennai. And he will also enlighten us today regarding the various uh, uh, newer aspect of research. So that will be definitely, I hope it will be an interesting session. And uh, Dr. Bharat, just uh, for uh, all of us, our information, this is our 26th session of uh, Critical Care Learning Network, where we do all these uh, activities for the DNB students across India and uh, across uh, Mumbai also. So welcome you to this, our group. And me, Dr. Gunadhar and Dr. Akles, I welcome you and uh, let's uh, start your topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunadhar, and thanks to all your colleagues. Thanks for this opportunity and this invitation. I'm, I'm excited to be doing this. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, this is, this is obviously a huge topic, and we'll have to decide what aspects we focus on. Um, since I was given an understanding that a lot of DNB candidates will be joining, I'm focusing on critical appraisal of a published paper today. I'll just go on to uh, presentation mode. Are you still able to see my screen? All is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, sure. Make it in a slideshow mode. Uh, we are able to see the small part of this screen. Yeah. Can you can you make it a full screen? Yeah. Is this better? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll get started. So as I said, today we'll focus on critical appraisal of uh, published research. And my idea or intention is to give a framework for clinicians. Uh, so that is the intention uh, of today's talk. So these are my disclosures. Uh, no relevant financial conflicts of interest as far as today's talk is concerned. I do have a couple of intellectual conflicts in that I'll be discussing two trials uh, which I was a co-investigator for. Uh, that's my email. Uh, so you can email me for slides and of course any questions even beyond the session. Uh, and that's me on Twitter. Uh, I use Twitter for purely academic uh, purposes. So we will basically be running through all of these things today. We will start with a scenario and then talk about why critical appraisal is important and why we all need to invest uh, time and energy in learning this uh, important skill. Uh, so the first 30 to 40 minutes will be basically focused on this. Uh, we will then take a break to take questions. And in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk a bit beyond critical appraisal and how as clinicians, we need to look at the data. Uh, that is a section called not all trials are created equal. Um, so there are certain assumptions or declarations that I need to make uh, before we get started. I assume that this audience would know the basics of study design. You're familiar with some of the terms such as randomization, blinding, etc. And uh, this session, as I said, will be basically focused on the fundamental principles of critical appraisal and, and not beyond that. And, and I'm happy to do sessions on other things. You are, we'll keep this as informal as possible. So you can interrupt me at any time, either unmute yourself and just shout out the question or you can post in the chat box and uh, Dr. Gunadar, I'll request you to just interrupt me if there are any questions in the chat, uh, I can answer it either immediately or at the end. Sure, and sure. We'll encourage all, all the delegates to put their questions in the chat box and we can take it one by one. Perfect. 
and all questions are welcome uh, so trainees in particular there is nothing called silly questions anything it, all questions are welcome and they are all basically just on you know different uh, they are just at different stages of a learning journey so please please ask what are the questions that come to your mind okay so this is a scenario with which we are going to start very very common typical scenario that you all see almost every day perhaps uh, uh, a 60 year old female diabetic coming in with symptoms of urosepsis and altered sensorium and in the er she gets fluid resuscitated gets intubated for the threatened airway and then gets transferred to your icu on dual vasopressors she gets an ultrasound done which shows hydroerythronephrosis she gets empirical antibiotics she gets shifted to the operating room gets a dj stent placed now it's been 12 hours since admission uh, let's assume that you are the icu fellow and you know a couple of fellows on duty you are the senior fellow um and it's been 6 hours since the procedure and 12 hours since admission she is unfortunately needing still 0.3 mics per kg per minute of norepinephrine and 1.8 units per hour of vasopressin as i said you are the senior fellow and uh, your your junior colleague comes to you and says you know uh, listen the vasopressors are still going on we've done post control why don't we just give this patient high dose vitamin c uh, for septic shock right and um uh, so she is asked he or she is asking you and uh, you unfortunately at this stage are only vaguely familiar with the literature on vitamin c so you don't know what to do so you do what you best do you basically uh, show them away and say go get yourself a coffee i'll meanwhile think about it um, and then you run to the nearest computer and do a quick pubmed search to see uh, if there is any literature on uh, high dose vitamin c so your search pulls up this paper uh, it's one of the first things to appear on your pubmed search this is a randomized controlled trial it's new in the journal of medicine so hopefully it's good it's published in june of this year so it's pretty recent right so you see this paper and uh, for some reason and it's not always the case you are also able to access the full paper which is which is not usually the case there is usually a paywall and you can't access but somehow you have the full paper with you and as as we all do we read the abstract sometimes we don't read the abstract we just go to the conclusions and the conclusions are clear in adults with sepsis receiving vasopressor therapy in the icu those that received iv vitamin c had a higher risk of death or persistent organ dysfunction at 28 days than those that received placebo so this trial in the new england journal of medicine that you found from june 2022 is actually showing harm with the use of vitamin c in patients that are on uh, vasopressors and those diagnosed with sepsis now is this enough can you stop here can you go back to your junior colleague and tell them that this is the answer there is no indication to give vitamin c or do you need to read this paper in detail can we just stop with the abstract or conclusion right so this is often a scenario that we face and a lot of us including myself are guilty of stopping at the abstract and the conclusions but so why can't you just read the abstract and conclusion i mean this is after all new england journal of medicine hopefully they are you know they are uh, stringent enough to make sure that you have a good abstract the problem though is even in leading journals abstracts don't often contain the key details that you need it doesn't tell you what kind of patients are in the trial it doesn't tell you much about the intervention it doesn't tell you much about the comparator what kind of outcomes they chose there may be key methodological details missing so for example you may not know whether the trial was blinded you may not know whether they did an intention to treat you may not know whether they followed up everyone right and all of these things matter because they will influence whether the trial is trustworthy or not authors may sometimes selectively present results that is they may present only the beneficial effects or they may selectively report certain outcomes and leave out certain other outcomes uh, because they want you know outcomes that have a p value less than 0.05 and conclusions that they provide are often not reflective or are not supported by the data that is underlying in the trial so these are all some of the problems with abstracts and this has been shown even for papers that have been published in the new england journal of medicine and jama all the things are much better now now the the journals are also much more stringent but it is still hard to get the full picture by reading just the abstract and the conclusion in my view critical appraisal that is the ability to read a paper and understand whether it's trustworthy or not is as vital a skill as your clinical examination right because in this day where we all are supposed to be practicing evidence based medicine unless we know how to critically appraise a paper it's it's very very hard to practice ebm right so with this i'm going to try and tell you how do we do critical appraisal i've tried to impress upon you why critical appraisal is important um 
So what is critical appraisal? The definition of critical appraisal is, it's a process of carefully and systematically examining research in order to judge whether it is trustworthy or not, and also to assess what is, what is its value and relevance to the context in which you work, right? So look at the words. You have to carefully and systematically look at the research. You have to judge whether you can trust it, the paper that you have in hand. And you have to also decide, is this paper, yes, it may be trustworthy, but is it actually relevant to you? So all of this is crucial part of critical appraisal, right? And when we, when we have to do critical appraisal, we need to go through a systematic process. So what is that systematic process? We basically have certain well-defined steps. So there are four key steps that are involved where we want to critically appraise a paper. And the framework is the same irrespective of whatever study design we use. The first question that you ask when you critically appraise is, what is the result? The results need to be valid. That is, can we trust the results that are under, that have been reported by the paper? What are these results? Can we interpret them? And how can these results be applied? So I'm going to take you through these four questions. And I'm going to use the same paper that you pulled out as the template to take you through these questions. So we will critically appraise the low bit trial, right? Okay. So the first question we ask when we critically appraise is, what is the research question? What is the research question that the authors are asking, right? And in this, we have to first ask about the relevance of the research question, and we have to ask about the context of the research question. So the context is, is vitamin C in septic shock, you know, is, is this relevant to our context, right? Is this question relevant to our patients in India, to our patients in the ICU in India that come in and accept this? Of course, it is relevant, right? We see septic shock from a variety of etiology, and it is as relevant to us as it is in the setting in which the trial was conducted. The trial was conducted in Canada, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, but it is important to us as much as it is important to them. The next thing you should examine is, if they're asking this question about vitamin C, is there some biological rationale for giving vitamin C in sepsis? So that is the question you need to ask. Where can you find this information? If you take, the, if you take this particular paper, you will find this information under the background section of the paper, and you can see what the authors have said here. So they've said, this is basically a snapshot of, the of a section of the paper. They're saying that in sepsis, vitamin C has some antioxidant effects. They're also telling you that vitamin C cannot be synthesized by humans, and in critically ill patients, vitamin C tends to be low. So they're giving you some biological rationale for why vitamin C may or may be helpful and why it should be tested in the randomized control trial. So when you start critical appraisal, the first question to ask is, what is the research question? Is it biologically making sense? Is it relevant to us, right? So on those parameters, this paper seems to be okay. Yes, there is biological rationale, and we think that this is relevant to our context. The next part we need to focus on is, what is the PICO? That is, what is the population intervention, comparator, and outcome that the trial included? I will tell you why this is important, because this is, so the population, we basically focus on the inclusion and exclusion criteria. In the intervention, we look at the dose of the therapy of the drug, whatever they're giving, what is the route that they use, what is the duration, is this drug available in our setting? When we look at the control arm, we should look at what is the control arm? Is it standard care? What is standard care? Is it usual care? Usual care in Apollo Bombay would be different to Apollo Chennai, right? There are obviously differences between what usual care might be. Are they using placebo in the comparator arm? Are they checking vitamin C against another vitamin or any other drug? So you need to look at each of these aspects in the first part of your critical appraisal. And the, the reason you look at the population is the kind of patients that have been entered into the trial, you want to compare whether those are the kind of patients you take care of in your ICU. Only then can those results be extrapolated to your setting or can be taken to your setting. So this is the first step in critical appraisal. After you ask the context and the relevance of the research question, you focus on the population, what kind of intervention they used, what is the comparator. The last but most important question to ask is also, what kind of outcomes did they look at? If Did they look at outcomes that matters to patient and families and clinicians? So for example, if this trial had said vitamin C versus placebo on CRP at day 28, who cares about CRP at day 28, right? If the CRP came down or didn't come down, do patients care? Yes, it might explain how a drug works, it may be of interest to scientists, it may be of interest to clinicians, but do patients care? What do patients care? Does vitamin C save lives? Does vitamin C get them out of the ICU for two days earlier, one day earlier? Does vitamin C make sure that you don't end up on dialysis, right? 
So the outcomes that patients care about are the outcomes that the trial should look at. This is not to say that they should not look at biomarkers, but in a phase three trial, in a definitive trial, we want to look at patient important outcomes or patient centered outcomes. In earlier phase trials, yes, they can look at CRP, they can look at POFA score, whatever they wish to look at. But in a definitive trial, we want to look at outcomes that matter to patients, families, and us. Right? They can also look at biomarkers, but that should not be the primary outcome. So this is the first part of the uh, critical appraisal after you, so you ask what is the research question, then you look at the PICO. Now, where will you find the information about this PICO? Where should the authors report it? They will typically report it under methodology, right? And if we take the vitamin C paper, all of these questions that we just asked are all answered here. So what kind of patients went into this trial? They were adults, more than or equal to 18 years of age. They had been in the ICU for no longer than 24 hours. That means they are enrolled early. They have a proven or a suspected infection as the main diagnosis, right? And they are receiving a vasopressor. So this is the criteria of inclusion. This is also the exact criteria that the patient that you have in front of you has. They're above 18, they're within the 24 hour window, they are in septic shock, right? So that's how you compare whether the patient in front of you and the trial are similar or not, because only then can you take that data. The next thing you look at is what kind of patients are they excluding? Because that is also important to know. They exclude those that have contraindications to vitamin C therapy. They've excluded those that have received open label vitamin C therapy that is outside the trial, if, or if they're expected to die within, 24, within 48 hours. So all of these are reasonable exclusion criteria. So you should also assess whether the investigators are using reasonable exclusion criteria, because that also matters, right? Are they excluding patients that you would be interested in? Then you're worried, right? Because then the results are no longer applicable to you. So you need to see, are they reasonable in the way they exclude patients? Then you need to know how was the intervention delivered? Because that is important for you to know whether you can do the same thing in your ICU, right? So you have to look at what was the dose? What was the route? So here they've told you, they gave IV vitamin C in a dose of 50 mg per kg. They gave it in 50 ml of dextrose or saline. They were given, you know, every six hours for 96 hours. So everything is described. They also tell you what the control arm was. In the control arm, they just give you, they just give dextrose or saline. And uh, that was a matched placebo, right? Now I said the outcomes are very, very important. What outcomes did they focus on? These guys focused on a composite outcome of death or persistent organ dysfunction. A very, very important patient-related outcome. And they focused on this by following patients up to 28 days. They also looked at a number of secondary outcomes. So there were biomarkers, et cetera, et cetera, but there were secondary outcomes. So, so far, the trial looks solid. They've asked an important research question. They have looked at biological plausibility. The population is similar to the kind of patients I care about. The intervention is available in India. I can deliver the intervention the same way that they delivered if I choose to. The comparator is a placebo and the outcomes are all outcomes that we care about. So we have now finished answering step one. That is the first question we asked in critical appraisal. Now we'll move to the next step. The next step we are going to ask, whatever results these authors are reporting, can we trust them, right? So this can we trust them also speaks to an issue called as internal validity. That is, are the results in, that the authors are reporting true in the context in which the study was conducted, right? Then there is external validity. That is, can the results be applied to an external population? So this question is looking at, can we trust the results, which means can we trust these results, are these internally valid or not? So for this internal validity, we will further ask this question under three subheadings, okay? So we will ask it under trial design, under trial conduct, and under trial and analysis. In the, as another colleague of mine tells, basically we will ask this question about, did the trial start well, did the trial run well, and did the trial finish well? because all of that will determine whether a trial can be trusted or not. So the first question under, are the results likely to be valid? We look at the trial design. So how was, how was randomization done? Was there allocation concealment? Was there blinding? Were the groups similar at baseline or not? So all of these are the key questions that come up when we are trying to answer this question. And where can you find this information? Methodology and in table one. There is a standard day in which trials have to be reported in today's era. So you will typically find this information in methodology and table one. Now let's look at what did they do? They randomly assigned patients in a one to one ratio to get vitamin C or placebo. They stratified it by site. They had a centralized web-based system for randomization. So randomization done well, right? It's done centrally. 
It's a one-to-one -one ratio, it's stratified, no problem. Because they use centralized web-based system allocation concealment. That is, the investigators not knowing what the next patient will get, whether it's vitamin C or placebo, is called allocation concealment. It's different to blinding. So allocation concealment is ensured because they use a web-based system. And blinding, they clearly tell you. They use the placebo and they also tell you that patients, clinicians, and trial personnel were all unaware of the trial group assignment, which means they were all blinded, right? So trial doing okay in terms of randomization, allocation concealment, blinding. The next question you want to ask is, were the group similar at base time? Why is this important? This is important because in a randomized controlled trial, the basic premise is that you create two groups that are comparable such that any effect you see can now be attributed to the intervention, right? That means you need to compare apples and apples. That's the only way you can know whether an intervention works or does not work. And that's the whole beauty of randomization. Now you need to check whether that randomization works well or not. So that is available in your table one. Look at table one. So apart from a difference in the proportion of female patients in vitamin C and placebo, so there's a 5% difference, all other characteristics are similar between the two groups. Their apathies are similar at baseline. Their SOFA score is similar at baseline. Their lactate is similar at baseline. Their baseline vitamin C is similar. So these two are groups that are comparable. Therefore, any results that I see of the intervention can be, you know, can be attributed to the intervention. So this is the first thing to look at. When you look at table one, there are three questions you will ask yourself. Any table one of a randomized control trial. The first question, are the groups comparable, which is what we just spoke about. The second question, are these the kind of patients I see in my ICU, right? I told this to you in the population uh, uh, part as well. You can again see. So what is the patient in this ICU the, in the trial? He, he or she is on average 65 years old. They're predominantly male. They're predominantly medical admission. They have a high Apache score, right? They have a baseline lactate, which is more than three. Now, this is the kind of patient I would see in my ICU. And I'm assuming the kind of patient that you would see in Apollo, Mumbai as well, right? So if, if that is the case, then I'm more reassured that this trial is answering a question I care about. So when you look at table one, question number one was, are the groups comparable? Question number two was, are these the kind of patients I take care of, right? Question number three is, apart from what has been reported in this table, are there other parameters that you want to see which are not reported in the table? So for example, if they're not reported the SOFA score, you would be a bit concerned because you want to know whether the SOFA was similar at base 10 as well, right? So this is the third question you ask whenever you look at table one. So this is the way you systematically look at the trial design part. So coming back, we are looking at are the results likely to be valid? We are asking whether the results are trustworthy or not. In that question, number one is about trial design. Did the trial start well? That is what we have answered now. Now we are going to go to the next question. Did the trial run well, right? What do we mean by that? Where all the patients followed up. After the baseline assessment, where patients treated similarly, what do we mean by that? That means one group should not be, you know, preferentially getting uh, better antibiotics. They should not be getting better source control. The group should be treated similarly throughout the duration of the trial. Only then can we be confident of the results, right? So this is called as co-interventions and the co-interventions have to be similar throughout the duration of the trial. Where will you find that information? You will again find it in table one or you will find it in a supplementary appendix where they will tell you how many people in each arm got source control, how many people got antibiotics, how many people got steroids and so on, okay? The next thing we want to know is how was the completeness of follow-up? Did all the patients that enter the trial get followed up? This is very, very important. If there are a lot of patients being missed for follow-up in one arm as compared to the other arm, we have a problem because that would create a bias, right? So we need to make sure that everybody that entered the trial or almost everybody that entered the trial are continued to be, are continuing in the trial and they have been followed up for their outcome. And you can see that that is the case here. Six patients in one arm and two patients had to be removed for certain reasons which is not a huge number. And all others were included in the analysis and they had a complete follow-up at day 28. So this reassures me that every patient that entered the trial was followed up until their you know, outcome, which is very, very important. So you will typically find this information in something called figure one or the consort diagram, which will tell you whether all the patients were followed up or not. So in was the trial conduct valid? You look at completeness of follow-up, 
and you look at co-intervention where they treated similarly after the trial started, right? So all this is very, very important. The, la the next question you ask, or the last question you ask for can we trust the results is how was the analysis done? Did the trial end well, right? So an analysis, we have to look at sample size. We have to look at whether they use an intention to treat or a per protocol approach. Did they clearly tell their analysis plan prior to looking at the data? Did they have interim analysis for safety? I won't get into the details of the statistical analysis, except to say that you will find all of this information under the section called statistical analysis. They tell you how they came to their sample size assumptions. They tell you what kind of analysis they used, And they also tell you about the interim analysis. So there was a data and safety monitoring board. They looked at the trial data after 250 and 525 patients had been enrolled. And the data safety monitoring board felt that everything was going okay and the trial could be continued to its completion, right? So there was interim analysis, no problem. Was the statistical analysis appropriate? You can take it from me that it was appropriate. In the interest of time, I won't expand on all of these aspects. I will talk a bit about sample size though. So whenever a trial is uh, arriving at a sample size, they, they usually have four things they need to worry about. They have to specify what is the power that they are going to take, what is the alpha or the type one error rate. They have to tell what is the uh, outcome expected in the control arm, and they have to tell you what is the benefit that the intervention arm will have, right? So the power is 80% and the alpha is 0 0.05, which is standard, we can accept it. So they said that in the control arm, 50% of the patients would either be dead or have persistent organ dysfunction at 28 days. And their hypothesis was that vitamin C would reduce this by 10%. That is 40% in the vitamin C arm would be dead or have persistent organ dysfunction as compared to 50% in the control arm. This 10% benefit that they're expecting is reasonable in my view. Most critical care trials or most critical care interventions will show a benefit of around 10%. So these assumptions are okay. The reason this is important is the larger the difference you wish to show, the lesser the sample size. So sometimes authors will say, we want to show a 20% improvement in survival. Their sample size will then come to 250 patients. So these are all intelligent ways of changing the sample size in order to fit their budget and their feasibility. So you should be very, very cautious when authors tell you that an intervention will save lives by 20%. Very few critical care interventions save lives by 20%. If you take the lung protective ventilation strategy, the absolute improvement in survival was 9%. If you take the recovery trial, the dexamethasone recovery trial, the absolute improvement, I think, for ventilated patients was 12%. So anybody saying that they're improving survival by 20%, you have to be very, very skeptical. So these guys said they expect a 10% improvement, which is reasonable. You could argue that it should perhaps be smaller, but 10% is a reasonable assumption. If they had said 5%, they would obviously need much more sample size. So that is the reason the sample size calculations are important. So this trial is doing okay so far in terms of how the trial started, how the trial ran, and how it has been analyzed. So we have now answered the question number two, can we trust the results? And the verdict seems to be that in my view, and it's a biased view, as I said, I'm part of this trial, I was part of this trial, it appears that the methods are robust and we can trust these results. The third question that we ask is, what are the results? Can we interpret them, right? In this, you will ask two questions. How large was the effect? How large was the benefit or harm or whatever that they showed? Where will you find this? In the results table two, usually, an additional table and figures. How precise was it? How confident are you that that is where the effect will be when you do it in your own ICU, right? So this is also in table two. Now, if we take the primary outcome, you know, let's look at the results. The primary outcome was death or persistent organ dysfunction. In the vitamin C arm, 44.5% of patients had died or had persistent organ dysfunction at 28 days. In the placebo arm, 38.5% had. So there was actually worse outcomes with vitamin C. 6% more patients were dead or had persistent organ dysfunction as compared to placebo. Now let's look at the effect. The effect is usually expressed as either an odds ratio or a relative risk or a hazard ratio. Here they're expressing it as a relative risk the relative risk is 1.21. That means there's a 21% more risk of dying or having persistent organ dysfunction in the vitamin C group as compared to the placebo group. Then let's not stop there. Let us look at the precision. How precise is this? 
the confidence interval goes from 1.04 that is a 4% increase in harm to a 40% increase in harm it's not very narrow but it's narrow enough for us to accept more importantly it's not crossing on the other side it's not going from 0.8 to 1.4 it's all on the same side which means i'm more confident that there is actually harm with vitamin c and no benefit then you look at the other outcomes all other outcomes also death is higher persistent organ dysfunction is higher when they break it down by components also you can see that vitamin c group is doing worse than the placebo group look at the risk ratios similar story here the confidence intervals are crossing but that's because they are starting to break it down by components but what i will look at is the direction overall direction in all the outcomes vitamin c is doing worse than placebo and the risk ratios are suggestive of harm so we have now interpreted the results one thing you will notice is there is no p value there is no need to have a p value right p value is the most overstated you know effect value that we see because it tries to tell you whether it is statistically significant or not you will as you you know learn more and mature more in these discussions you will realize that p value is the least relevant here what i would care about is the effect estimate and the confidence interval this is obviously statistically significant but we don't need to know that or we don't need to see that right okay now let's move to the last question so these are additional results you will see the kaplan meier survival curve that they have plotted as you can see vitamin c is doing worse in terms of survival and the separation in the curve starts as early as the first week and it continues on right vitamin c is doing worse red the blue is vitamin c less survival as compared to placebo when you are interpreting as a clinician you also need to go look up other outcomes what is happening with other secondary outcomes what is happening with subgroups are there more adverse events reported because you don't want to judge a trial purely only on the basis of a primary outcome you also want to look at other outcomes that have been reported this is not to say that if the primary outcome is showing harm you selectively then go pick up a secondary outcome that is showing benefit and say i'll use vitamin c this is just to say that you need to look at the totality of the outcomes because those outcomes will influence maybe the next trial what are the unknowns that we still have and how do we answer this question going forward the last question we will ask in critical appraisal is now having gone through this process having uh, seen what is the research question having seen whether we can trust the results having seen whether what is the results and how to interpret them are these results actually applicable to my patient right so um how do you judge this you again go back to the inclusion exclusion criteria what do we look there are the are the patients included in the trial similar to the people i take care of if they are similar to the people i take care of i can apply these results are the outcomes they included outcomes that i care about if they are then i can use those results then i also need to think about other things is vitamin c easily available is it a cheap drug is it accessible in my unit right can i prepare the drug the same way they did i think so vitamin c is easily available it's cheap it's you know in any case the trial showed harm but if it had shown benefit it was all available to us the last thing but it's not it's a very very important thing is we need to look at conflicts of interest did a vitamin c trial did a vitamin c company fund this trial or did somebody else with some you know interest commercial interest fund the trial so let us look at it this is also present this is also obviously reported in the trial the trial was funded for a no, by a not for profit and the trial funders had no input into the design planning analysis etc of the trial so the trial was done by independent scientists and not by uh, the pharmaceutical company or anybody else and the glucometers were provided by a company but that's kind of all that uh, that they contributed to so you also look at these questions when you talk about applicability then we need to ask certain other questions so what was not answered in this trial so a couple of things one uh no patients from india were enrolled or from other lower middle income country um there is a separate trial called lobit india where we enroll patients in india and and those will be published separately but in this particular nejm paper no patients from india were included in india we know that there is a different pattern of infection we see a higher multi drug resistance burden there are differences in healthcare systems so to that extent the applicability of the results do come down right and one more thing is from the trial itself it's not clear why more vitamin c patients died right uh, because when we look at whether they had more acute kidney injury hemolysis etc there is no signal so we don't know why more patients in the vitamin c harm died right so these are the unanswered questions that we have so far so now summarizing the systematic process that we have taken we started with the trial that you pulled out from pubmed we went through the whole rigorous process of asking these four questions and our summary is that the trial is answering a clinically important question which is relevant to our population 
we can agree that the trial methodology is rigorous and the results are internally valid we can apply these results to our population overall but there are some unanswered questions so if i were the senior icu fellow or the attending consultant i think that there is enough information to say that i would not use vitamin c now i have to caution you that this is a simplified version obviously i don't make decisions on the basis of one randomized control trial even when it's in the new england journal of medicine even when it's a large trial you generally make decisions by taking the totality of the evidence that means you would look for another high quality systematic review or a meta analysis and then hopefully somebody would have you know provided some provided some clinical guidelines putting together all of that information but in general uh, much of the systematic reviews uh, results would also be influenced by this trial because it's it's one of the highest uh, quality trials and has the largest number of patients but to me at this point in time there is no reason i would be giving vitamin c uh, as per how the how this it was given in this trial to patients with septic shock so now you have an answer for your junior fellow hopefully you know this process you have done by the time they come back from coffee and you can actually tell them that this is the answer and i would not give vitamin c for these reasons so i'm going to now pause um, maybe just one last slide before i pause when you, this is the critical appraisal of a randomized control trial but obviously you may not have only randomized control trials you may have to deal with observational studies you may have to deal with diagnostic studies and so on the principles of critical appraisal remain the same so you have to ask the same four questions right and it will follow the same structure and template but you do need to be familiar with certain aspects of the study right like you have to know something about confounding if you are dealing with observational studies so you have to know about sensitivity specificity if you are dealing with diagnostic studies so you do need to understand certain concepts but you do not need to be a methodologist you do not need to be a statistician to understand this in fact critical appraisal is actually a skill that clinicians need to have not methodologists not statisticians and there are a number of online tools that are available that can help us in this process of critical appraisal as well and these are the links you can you can look it up and they basically go through exactly what i've just uh, spoken about right now uh, i have another 10 15 minutes of talk but that's going to go beyond critical appraisal what are the concerns so i'm going to pause here and on what we have covered so far i'm very very happy to take questions or clarify if there are uh, if there are anything that we need to clarify yeah bharat uh, yeah dr bharat it's a, i think it's a one of the wonderful uh, lecture you have so uh, first of all i would definitely like to congratulate you for this uh, kind of uh, uh, your uh, presentation which is very lucid and clear and actually it has uh, almost uh, clearly uh, clarified most of the doubts uh, so the just um, uh, in uh, my question is Uh, so uh, how quickly and uh, how effectively we can just uh, read a trial uh, with a few of the headings that if you can describe quickly so that uh, most of the papers if a research fellow or dnv student they read they can easily able to know that uh, these are the loopholes and these are the drawbacks of the paper absolutely yeah the fastest way to reading a trial would be to basically look at the definitely read the abstract but after that the key things to look at are table 1 because that will tell you whether the patients are comparable or not it will also tell you what kind of patients are in the trial then you should look at table 2 the figure 1 which is the flow of patients that i was talking about you know did everybody get followed up did everybody get treated similarly etc so after we read the abstract and the conclusions we should read table 1 figure 1 table 2 and any other additional figures so if you read those itself for the most part you will know if you have only 10 minutes i would focus on that and i would follow the same steps that i described but by just focusing on those parts of the paper uh if you have more time yes you can obviously read through the whole paper but at the bit side we may not often have time so if you want to do a quick appraisal i think focus on the abstract and then the tables and figures okay great great so uh, there are other few questions like uh, just in a brief uh, what is alpha error and what is intention to treat and what is one is to one ratio yeah so sure. we yeah. are the question basically asked from our uh, our uh, colleagues and fellows so by dr yeah. vijay kumar dr kavita and uh, others so sure happy to answer yeah. so we start with uh, type 1 error and uh, type 2 error so basically type 1 error is as you all know every trial starts with a null hypothesis it starts with a hypothesis that uh, there is no difference between the two arms so in the case of vitamin c uh, the trial will start saying that there is no difference between the vitamin c and placebo 
in terms of the primary outcome that is mortality and persistent organ dysfunction now the aim of the researcher is to try and reject that null hypothesis that there is no difference that is why you are doing that is usually the higher you know aim of the researcher now type 1 error is when the the error that happens when you show that there is a difference between the vitamin c arm and the placebo arm when in reality there is no such difference that is if you actually knew the truth there was no difference but erroneously your study is showing a difference right for some whatever reasons there are some methodological flaws or whatever have happened in your trial and that is erroneously showing that there is a difference between vitamin c and placebo even though in reality there is actually no difference so that is called the type 1 error rate now we try to typically keep the type 1 error rate to under 5% so that is where that alpha of 0.05 comes which is nothing but 5% basically we are trying to say that there should be a less than 5% chance of reaching such an erroneous conclusion so that is the reason we keep that alpha you can say that 5% is too high we should make it 1% sure but when you do that your sample size will obviously go up right so that is the type 1 error rate type 2 error rate is you are not finding a difference between vitamin c and placebo even though there was a difference between them that is your trial failed to pick up a difference although there was a difference so this is called the beta error or the type 2 error rate typically we will accept 10% or 20% power is nothing but 100 minus the beta so in this case they took 20% as the error uh, type 2 error so 100 minus 20 80% is basically your power right so power and beta are connected concepts and alpha error or type 1 error are connected concepts so you basically set certain rules how much of uh, a false positive i am willing to accept which is type 1 error and how much of a false negative i am willing to accept which is a type 2 error right the common example that is also given is like you have a obviously pregnant woman and if you say she is not pregnant that is a type 2 error rate on the other hand you have a man and you call the man pregnant it's a type 1 error right so that's a common simple example that people give but the concept is false positive and false negative so that is alpha and beta and that's the explanation for that the next question was about intention to treat versus per protocol correct yes yes okay so intention to treat and per protocol are two ways of analyzing the data intention to treat means once a patient is randomized you will analyze them in that arm only irrespective of whether they got the intervention irrespective of whether they continued to be followed up for the whole duration or not that is intention to treat in per protocol you will analyze them to the intervention that they actually received so if, if there are no 200 patients that got randomized to vitamin c but only 180 received it you will only analyze the 180 in the vitamin c arm and the 180 in the placebo that got it whereas in intention to treat the minute they are randomized you have to analyze them whether they ended up receiving the drug or not why do we do this why do we take such an approach right so there is an excellent write up in this month's critical care communications newsletter about the difference between intention to treat versus per protocol it's written by dr ram raj gopal i all i recommend that all of you go and read it uh, it's in the critical care newsletter that was that just came last week right so um, why do we do intention to treat because we want to minimize the the intention to treat will ensure that you don't falsely declare a positive result i'll give you an example so let us say we are doing a trial where we are uh, enrolling patients to undergoing cardiac surgery versus uh, medical man uh, angioplasty slash medical management for coronary syndrome right now you are randomized 200 patients to cardiac surgery 200 patients to angioplasty what happens in the angioplasty arm everybody gets medical treatment and angioplasty in the cardiac surgery arm of the 200 patients about 20 of them while they are waiting for their surgery they die right so only 180 get the surgery now in a intention to treat i would analyze all the 200 in that arm and all the 200 in this arm in per protocol you will decide to exclude the 20 that did not get cardiac surgery and died before the cardiac surgery and you will only take the 180 patients that got the cardiac surgery what is the problem the problem is in reality also patients who are waiting for cardiac surgery will die now if you take them out of that arm you are falsely or spuriously making that arm look better imagine you are taking 20 deaths out of an arm you are not counting it under that arm you are spuriously making that arm look better in reality also patients will die while they are waiting for cardiac surgery so all the 200 patients in that arm need to be analyzed whether they get the cardiac surgery or not all the 200 patients in medical arm also should be analyzed whether they get the angioplasty or not the reason to do this is you do not want to falsely declare 
that something is working when it actually is not so. That is, you want to reduce your type one error rate. So this is why we do an intention to treat analysis. Please, please go read the newsletter. There's a very, very, it's just a one page write up by Dr. Ram Raj Gopal. It's excellent about ITT versus per protocol. Hopefully that answered the question. Yes. And uh, what is this one is to one uh, ratio basically asked by Dr. Hari. One is to one means basically every patient, the, every patient that you get has an equal chance of getting into either of the arms, vitamin C or placebo. And there are equal patients assigned. So as patients get randomized, one will go into the, uh, inter eventually one will be in the intervention arm, one will be in the placebo. It will not be that every alternate patient will go because then it becomes predictable. It won't be predictable. But at the end of the trial, equal number of patients will be there. 400, for example, in this trial, 400 and odd were in the vitamin C arm and 400 odd were in the placebo arm. You can also do one is to two, one is to three, et cetera, other types of randomization. But typically we will do a one is to one randomization. That means they'll be equally distributed in the two groups. So um, as we discussed um, earlier, while screening the patients, um, you know, or the uh, when we try to critically appraise the paper, we also look at whether the population is equal in terms of uh, region or state or country or the continent okay suppose the study is done in the western side and we uh, we transpolate the data or the results to our population how are we you know uh, you know the good oh, enough very good. how are we good enough in uh, you know interpreting the yeah, data I'm and I'm use those results for our population so can you just highlight on that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So that's a great question. Um, I briefly spoke about this and I spoke about the vitamin C too. So the question, obviously sepsis in India is, uh, you know, septic shock exists here, septic shock exists in the West, for example, in this trial, that's not very different. But what is different? We have more MDR organisms. We have more tropical infection. We have issues with access to healthcare, right? So there are very different population characteristics as compared to the Western nations where the trial was conducted. So you do have to balance that. And that is a bit of an unanswered question about whether we can directly use the result. So that challenge is there as I was highlighting, you know, when we were talking about applicability, but I will, I will, I usually look at it in this way. So it depends upon the question. For example, if you take lung protective ventilation, right? So that's 12 ml, you know, 6 ml per kg versus 12 ml per kg. That trial will be, inter will be as good for us as it is for the Western population. There is no reason to think that Indian lungs and Indian ARDS is going to be different, right? So it depends upon what the pathology is, and we definitely don't need to repeat a, a, a you know a lung protective ventilation trial in India to show that Indian patients uh, will have different results or not. But for a trial, for example, if you're looking at steroids in ARDS, right, the risk in India might be very very different because we may get more fungal infection, we may get more multi resistant organism infection. So if a steroid trial shows benefit in the best. We can't just directly use those results to us because we do need to be cautious about what is the side effect profile in our patients and in our population. The third instance, there are questions where those guys are not doing trials. These are our problems, you know, snake bites, dengue, malaria, scrub typhus. These are all other problems. No Western country is ever going to do a trial for those problems. We have to do our own trials and find therapy. So always I look at it at these ways. If the disease is similar, patient population characteristics should not change, you know, then you accept the results from the West directly. If there is another layer of subtlety, like in vitamin C, our infections are different, then you have to be cautious in directly using the results. The third level is your own problems where you have to find the answers and you can't wait for the West to do so. Certainly, there is definitely a change in the demographic profile of uh, the population in India compared to others. Like you said in ARDS also, I mean, when we are trying to manipulate plateau pressures we don't know transpulmonary pressure or something like that mm -hmm. that the plateau pressure for that population uh, may be good enough but for our lungs which are small our population our people are small in size or something like that the surface area is also low so in that regard it's i i think it's still a gray area really i mean whether we can transpolate the data uh, of the western world to our population i still have a doubt but i think you have rightly said like uh, Apart from the demographic profile, if the disease condition is the same, probably we can use the data, but we should have our own data. That is what it feels like. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. And in fact, the solution to this is one, we run our own trials. Two, we participate in all these big trials where, you know, 
so that more and more indian patients you know patients from our regions get enrolled because then we are more confident about the results absolutely no doubt about that just to continue the thing so another thing is to can you just please focus on the power of the study so this is one of the questions which is very important and asked by uh, one of our uh, fellows so, so i answered about the power power is the ability to pick up a difference when a difference exists so it's related to the beta or the type 2 error rate so if you do not find a difference between vitamin c and placebo when a difference actually existed you are making a type 2 error so the type 2 error is if you say 20% then the power of the trial is 100 minus 20 which is 80% what does that mean that means you have 80% power to pick up a difference if a difference existed between the two groups okay and how does it affect your sample size yeah so the higher the power the higher the sample size so if you want 90% power to pick up a difference your sample size will go up if you need 95% power your sample size will go up further so the higher the so i tell what all the influence of sample size if you want a lower alpha so instead of 5% if you want 1% type 1 error rate your sample size will go up if you want a higher power 90 95% your sample size will go up if you want to find a small difference between the two groups so as in this case i was saying if you want to find a 5% difference in mortality between vitamin c and placebo your sample size will go up so researchers usually play around a bit with these numbers and try to come to the sample size that they think they can enroll right all all trials have to make these choices uh, there is nothing wrong about it because there is only finite amount of money available to do trials so researchers have to be making these choices all the time yeah so i think uh, we can just uh, uh, go to the uh, this the next session and sure. then we'll be yeah. having some discussion perfect i i'll probably just take another 10 15 minutes and then we can discuss no yeah Definitely. thank you thank you perfect so uh, now i want to move to the next section what i call as not all trials are created equal so what i'm talking about here is basically i want you to go beyond just the physical appraisal there are other additional nuances to consider and i'll show you and i'll illustrate this by showing two clinical scenarios or research scenarios okay you can still see my slides all okay yeah okay so this is the first scenario where i want to highlight this thing about clinical significance and statistical significance so this is a trial that we were involved in where uh, you all know that the recovery trial showed that 6 mg dexamethasone was saving life so we wanted to see whether a higher dose as compared to 6 mg would be more beneficial in patients that had severe covid you no know, covid and severe hypoxemia so we conducted this large 1000 patient randomized trial from europe and india we enrolled about 40% of the patients from india um, and if you look at the primary outcome which is number of days alive without life support at 28 days right that is the primary outcome now in the 12 mg group it was 22 days that is 22 days on an average patients were alive and free of organ support in the 12 mg dose in the 6 mg dose it was 20.5 days so lower right so 12 mg seems to be better than 6 mg and the difference is 1.3 days but look at the conference interval it is going to zero that means there could be no difference or it can be as high as 2.6 days right and obviously because of this our p value ends up at 0.07 heartbreaking right because we want 0.05 that's what we all been told and this is now 0.07 so that means i can't claim statistical significance so should i stop should i not should i just throw this trial away should i just say oh it's not statistically significant can we ignore it unfortunately i mean fortunately no we cannot stop at just looking at statistical significance because statistical significance itself is arbitrary this p o point point o five was an arbitrary pick right somebody could have said point 1 in which case i would be statistically significant right so this is an arbitrary pick and it is not clinically relevant it is not clinically useful so what should we do in our trial we did a bunch of other things so we did something called a pre planned bayesian analysis in a bayesian analysis instead of i won't get into the details of bayesian analysis because i think it's beyond the scope of this session but essentially bayesian analysis will tell us what is the probability that an intervention works your frequentist analysis will never tell you what is the probability of something working so when we did the same trial we looked at a bayesian analysis the same outcome days alive without life support we found that there was a 94% probability that 12 mg would be better than 6 mg so we provide you more information we are providing you more context to answer the same clinical question because 
that trial, I mean, the, just the statistical significance is not going to answer it. So you have to go one step further. And then important, look at the harm. Is there any probability of harm? The probability of harm with 12 milligrams is only 5.8%. That means the probability of harm is low. The probability of benefit is high with a 12 milligram. So this is the next piece of information you should look at. Then what do you ask next? What are the long-term outcomes? So we followed these patients up to 90 days. When you look at it, 12 milligrams, here the, the curve is shown the other way around. Uh, 12 milligrams is doing better. More and more patients in 12 milligram are surviving. And you can see that their, their survival curves are beginning to separate by the day 14, second week, and it stays separate. We followed the patients up to 180 days, and still 12 milligram is doing better than 6 milligram. So if I had dismissed the results, just based on statistical significance, all of this information is lost, right? So whenever we interpret a trial, we need to look beyond just statistical significance, right? So that is the point that I want to illustrate. Unfortunately, not all trials will do what we have done, where we have given you so much data, but as a clinician, you need to start looking beyond just statistical significance. How do you do this? You ask yourself four questions. Is it biologically possible that higher dose steroids would help? Yes, there is data from prior COVID studies as well as non-COVID studies, ARDS, that up to 20 milligrams of dexamethasone may be helpful. So it is possible that a higher dose is helpful in most sicker patients. What is the balance of benefits and harm? As I said, 94% probability of benefit only a 5% probability of harm. That means there's a good balance of benefit and harm. Is steroid easily available? Yes, dexamethasone is cheap, it's available everywhere. So there's no challenge. So whenever you're interpreting the study results, please go beyond just looking at statistical significance. So that is point number one that I want to make. The next point that I want to make with another scenario is, we all have certain favorite drugs, favorite hypothesis, you know, all, all, for all of us come with these biases. When we have a bias, that we, we have, you know, all of us have certain things that we think work or don't work. If we see a study that favors our bias, we tend to take that, right? We tend to adopt that. So I'll show you an example of something like that. I'll show you two examples, actually. So this is the now infamous Paul Merrick trial, which is now, of course, maligned for all the right reasons, which basically was a very, very small observational study of 90 patients, just 90 patients, which showed a huge survival by using this HAT protocol, hydro hydrocortisone, ascorbic acid, and thymine, right? 40% of patients die when they don't get HAT, and 8.5% of patients die when they get HAT. 32% improvement in survival. There is no critical care intervention that has saved so many lives. Like, there's literally nothing that has shown such an effect. So when you see such an effect, you should already be worried, right, that there is a problem. This effect is the size of something like penicillin, right? When, penicillin, when there were no antibiotics, and when antibiotics came about, this is the kind of survival that you would see. So when you're trying, when somebody is showing you penicillin-like effects, you should be wary. You should be worried. Why is this happening, right? As I was telling, when we did the, when they did the lung protective ventilation, the absolute benefit was 9%. Most critical care trials will not show a benefit of more than 10%, 12%. So when somebody is saying there's a 32% improvement in survival, you better be cautious, right? But unfortunately, people were not. This got adopted across the world. People started using the HAT therapy, and they saw similar, very, very impressive results in all the other outcomes as well. What people forgot is that this is a retrospective observational study, not an RCT, only 90 patients coming from one center, right? People did not realize this at all, and they adopted it. But fortunately, people started doing, other sensible people, researchers across the world, started doing higher, better quality studies, larger studies. A number of trials came, I won't go into all of that, but this is an example of one of them called the vitamins trial, um, which had 200 patients, which was a randomized trial, well done trial. And you will see that for the primary outcome, there is no difference between the HAT protocol and the no HAT protocol. But more importantly, in the HAT arm, mortality was slightly higher. It, it was not statistically significant, but if anything, it appeared to be higher than the no HAT protocol. So when you see a study that confirms your bias, please be more cautious, right? Because we don't want, this is called a confirmation bias. So we should be cautious and whenever there's an observational study showing benefit, always wait for a high quality RCT. Another example of something similar. This is the, again, famous, infamous reverse paper that proposed this early gold direct therapy. You do a bunch of things. You give lots of fluid to put a central line, you measure SCVO2, you know, you do a bunch of things and say, and, and they said they did this in one center, they randomized patients to uh, these approaches, and they showed a 15% improvement in survival, right? 46% death, in the standard arm, in the EGTT arm, 
15%, 30%. So 15% improvement, highly statistically significant. But one center study, remember one center RCT and showing a larger than usual effect. Again, a bunch of researchers across the world came together. They did multiple trials. There were three big trials uh, and none of these trials showed any of the benefit that the early uh, gold data therapy, the initial reverse paper showed. So whenever you see a large effect, whenever you see effects from either a small observational study or a small RCT, please wait for better studies to come about. Science is all about reproducibility. That means people should be able to confirm what you found. If you are not able to confirm what somebody found, most likely it's not real, right? The effect is not real. So in summary, I'm going to wrap up with this slide. Critical appraisal is an essential skill for anybody that is practicing clinical medicine. This has nothing to do with methodological expertise or being a researcher. It is an essential skill. As I said, it's as important as clinical examination. It is a cornerstone of the practice of evidence-based medicine. It has to be systematic. You have to go through all these four questions that I highlighted. Trials that are internally valid may still may not be you know, applicable to your context as we just discussed. And not all trials or studies are created equal. With that, I will wrap my talk up. I'm again open to taking questions. Uh, I'll also stop sharing my screen so that it's easy for people to ask questions. Thank you for patiently listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, I would uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Subhadeep and Dr. Subrajit. So, uh, Dr. Subrajit, if you are here, Subrajit Bhomik, so can you just enlighten some of the aspects of critical appraisal of the paper? So, Dr. Subrajit, anyway, so uh, Dr. Subhadeep. Yeah, hi, hi, Dr. Gunadar. Hi. Are you, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, no, so, so this was a kind of very wonderful talk by, uh, by Dr. Gunadar. So, uh, I think he has, he has explained in everything in a such a lucid way. And critical appraisal is, is always such a kind of so important things in in day to day clinical practice. I was uh, it was very uh, important the way that he has started his presentation by stating a kind of uh, everyday the clinical way that the, say it's the junior asks the senior that the what needs to be done the senior is going to uh, uh, going for a coffee and then checks the pub bed. So it's very interesting. I, I must say that the, it's a, it's a, it's, it was a very good talk in, in a way. And uh, as he has already say, said that the critical appraisal is one of the important aspects of day-to-day -day clinical practice. It is very important for the DNB students also how to learn a critical appraisal in the, you know, uh, of, the, of a study. It is one of the table probably in the, in the, in the DNB Viva uh, they usually ask the students to uh, to critically appraise one patient uh, of, of, of a paper uh, in the in the exam. So sometimes what happens is that you have not read the paper and you have got the paper uh, on the ex you are seeing the paper in the in the ex in the exam only. In that way, if you do not know how thoroughly and effectively appraise the paper, then you might get stuck. So in that way, Dr. Varun's approach will be is is much 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 much, much better. So nothing more to say from my side otherwise, uh, but it was very nice and wonderful talk to hear from my side as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I think Dr. Subrajit has also joined. So Dr. Subrajit. Yeah, hello. Hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, really want to thank Dr. Bharat Kumar for that excellent presentation. It was very, very mind opening. And I would say that this kind of discussion is required for postgraduate training. My regards to Dr. Tandekar also. So, Dr. Tandekar got hi, the opportunity. Hi. To... hi, hi. Lovely to meet you. And uh, sorry, I'm probably traveling. So, um, you might. Uh, so, it was lovely to meet you in Mumbai. Hoping to see you guys again soon. So, yes, I think very importantly for clinicians to understand research is because, you know, uh, we all believe that clinicians are very powerful with due respect. Let me tell you a disclaimer that the most powerful people on mm -hmm. earth are the mm -hmm. pharmaceutical company people. So, please, please don't be a puppet uh, in the hand of pharmaceutical companies because they know how to play around with data. And uh, especially as Dr. Kumar was mentioning that 
not all clinical trials are adequately powered. And um, I would say that learning and to do your thesis is very, very essential because this gives you an hands-on experience of how you would conduct research in the days to come. Because some of you for sure will become you know, medical teachers, you will be devoting your time to medical teaching. So please, uh, please, please do this seriously. Don't do a control C, control V mode. And uh, because many times we kind of just do inclusion, exclusion criteria and, you know, without even knowing people, somebody was asking me, per, I saw the question, very important question, per protocol and in, per, you know, intention to treat. I put it this way that, you know, if you're a very strict examiner, then you only pass those students who have received the pass marks. So you become a per protocol. And if you also pass those patients who have, or, or, or rather pass those students who have uh, been borderline, then you become a intention to treat. So people or patients who have qualified for all visits, they become per protocol uh, analysis, uh, uh, you know, they, they will be used in the analysis. But intention to treat or modified intention to treat is the most commonly used method where you will have patients dropping off. So that is an, an important thing. And uh, lastly, I would also say if uh, you, you're all busy there, if you need any help in doing your thesis, uh, we have a small cons uh, you know firm which uh, is involved in developing theses uh, for postgraduate trainees, of course, in discussion with them. So it's called 3MD Healthcare Communication Consultants. And so you can reach out to us. We have been helping a lot of doctors publish their findings. We are helping a lot of uh, young, junior, postgraduate trainees. I think, I think your voice is breaking, Dr. Subrajit. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, you know, if you go here, that you know, they're always there to partner with you. And uh, if uh, if anybody is interested, we can definitely you can you can jolly well go to our websites www.3md.in. It's a number three, and uh, and check it out for yourself www.3md.in, where we have been partnering with many many doctors, practicing doctors, and we have been uh, providing them. Uh, statistical analysis support. You have a lot, large database of patients, you know, dengue patients, COVID patients. Many of my critical care friends have said, what do we do with this data? So that's dangerous sometimes because you need to plan a hypothesis. But we have tried and uh, analyzed those kind of data and then help generate manuscripts as well. And of course, as I mentioned, as Dr. Padi also knows about it, that we help the young postgraduate trainees to also uh, develop their theses if the requirement comes in. Thank yes. you for including me and uh, yes. Absolutely. Uh, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subrajati. So any, anybody who would like to uh, be associated with us and uh, Dr. Subrajati, definitely they can contact uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in his email ID or his website. And I would also like to thank Dr. Bharat. So the last uh, word of uh, this thing, appreciation uh, to Dr. Bharat and I would like to hear so uh, I think Dr. Bharat is working on some of the registries of this uh, research work. So can you can we just uh, have a brief glimpse of those registry so that it will help us in critical care practice, Dr. Bharat? If you can just highlight. Sure. Uh, I uh, so I think uh, I might have to do a separate presentation on that. But essentially, we ran a critical care registry called IRIS. So we basically collect you know we set it up very similar to the UK registry, the like Kitnar and the other. ANSIX and other registries. Essentially, it's just a routine data collection of all patients that come into your ICU, but it's on an electronic uh, you know, platform so that you can generate your own reports, you can track your own you know, outcomes, quality indicators, and so on. So we've been doing this for about three years now. I'm very happy to do a full 30-minute presentation on it because there is actually a lot more to share. So Dr. Gunadar, if you can maybe get me a slot sometime, I'm very happy to do that. Yeah. Hey, sure, sure. Why not? We would like to have a series of such presentations because this is the need of the time. And uh, definitely- There's one be... question. There's one question. So which website would be more useful um, as far as appraisal of uh, papers are concerned? Uh, what would be the website that the students who should be able to go through, which will help them to 
learn about the principle of particles more and more yeah i'll i'll actually just post the link in the uh, chat box uh, there are these critical appraisal tools that are available online uh, i'm just going to post one example of those they're all free resources so basically it will take you through the same steps that i spoke about today uh, but there is a checklist available so you can basically you know just tick and go and it will also tell you how to interpret uh, each of those steps so i've just uh, posted it in the chat box right now okay and what about this iris registry because what kind of help you can get from this iris registry so the registry itself as i said is basically for routine data collection of all the patients that are coming to your icu so that is the first level and then within the registry we can do quality improvement and research so we are actually now doing randomized controlled trials using the registry so there are three layers to the registry routine data collection quality improvement and research and you can participate in all three or just in one of those so uh, like i said i think i would need to actually demonstrate it and give you a talk uh, it will take about 30 minutes so any day that you all wish to i can do it okay and, okay. and i just uh, i'm just going to post the link for the registry here but it will need me to actually do a talk because the website won't have a lot of information uh, we still need to meet at some point to talk a bit more about it but i'm just posting the link here again oh oh great so definitely we would like to have uh, the presentation on this and uh, sure. i I'll, I'll, i'll coordinate with you dr gunadhar and we'll set it up yeah yeah please 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 so uh, any any questions from anybody i i want to thank everyone uh, for the opportunity and of course for patiently listening and some great questions that were posed so thank you for that for that the yeah, i think uh, statistical analysis itself is a vast topic probably i think we will uh, like to have a more in depth sure. discussion on this topic as well because you know whatever we read you know it's it's so much volatile that next moment i mean a week or later you may not be able to recapitulate as to what you have had analyzed or you learned so i think that is also one of the important topic that we may have a discussion later on so but nevertheless uh, dr bharat it was indeed a wonderful uh, presentation i mean uh, most of the students all, all all of all of them have liked it and would like to hear from you time again and again and it shows your depth of understanding of the topic and uh, the command on the subject mm -hmm. so i think it should be beneficial to the uh, society at large uh, especially the students of uh, the critical care medicine should be benefited with this yeah and just for the info actually we will planning to conduct the few sessions on this research and methodology and uh, how to write a thesis topic and uh, how to select a, a protocol and uh, dr bharat definitely will help us uh, in organizing the talk happy to please yeah 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 thank you thank you so, so, so we are we are already uh, we have already overshoot uh, shoot yes. the time so now let's conclude and really thank you uh, thank you thank you all uh, dr so bharat on behalf of apollo critical care uh, on uh, mumbai and on behalf of all the students i, I thank you all thank you very thank much you. thanks thank you thank, you. thank, you. thank you. you thank all the delegates and dr gunadhar and all, all my colleagues i thank you all thanks and then goodbye good night good night thank you very good much night. thank you